the one you showed up to hear anyway. Um, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Um, just a quick plug, as always, we welcome sponsorships for Judaic Enrichment Programming and other programming. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor tonight's event or any other event, please get in touch with me, David Sheffy, or the Shul Office. Uh, as a reminder for the best experience during tonight's lecture, please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you are uh, deliberately speaking. Um, we're honored to hear tonight from Professor Eve Kurkowski on the topic of the Cairo Geniza and everyday Judaism in medieval Egypt. Uh, Professor Kurkowski is Assistant Professor of Near Eastern Studies and Judaic Studies at Princeton University. She's a social historian of the medieval Middle East, especially family life and how law and religion worked in mundane everyday settings. Her research focuses on urban Jews in Fatimid and Ayyubid, Egypt, 969 to 1250 BCE, a population we learn much about from the famous Cairo Geniza documents. Her award-winning first book, Coming of Age in Medieval Egypt, Women's Adolescence, Jewish Law and Ordinary Culture, was published by Princeton in 2018 and uses Geniza documents and Jewish and Islamic legal writings to examine how gender, kinship and rabbinic law interacted to shape Jewish women's coming of age and transition to first marriage in medieval Egypt and Syria. Uh, without further ado, I'll welcome and turn the floor over to Professor Krakowski. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everybody for having me and for showing up uh, to your computer screens after a long day. Um, at least I had a long day, I assume you all did as well. Um, so I was invited to talk about the Cairo Geniza documents and the kinds of work that I do with them. Um, and I thought that instead of giving like a kind of, you know, lecture showing one particular research point that it would be more enjoyable for everybody to have a kind of informal workshop. Um, so what I'm going to do is spend most of the time showing you some especially interesting documents and talking about them together, um, which is really the best way of getting to know this material and the kinds of historical questions that it illuminates, the kinds of historical work that um, is possible to do uh, with these documents. Um, but I'm going to start with a brief introduction to the Geniza documents to orient us. So I'm going to talk now for about 10-15 minutes. I'll ask everybody to stay muted during that time, um, and then we'll start going into a more conversational mode. Okay, so what's the Geniza? Since you all showed up, um, I'm guessing you probably all have an idea of what the Cairo Geniza is, but just in case, um, I'll start from uh, the ABCs. So the Geniza is a massive collection of around 300,000 medieval and some later texts written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, and um, most commonly Judeo-Arabic, which is simply the vernacular of the day, um, what's usually called Middle Arabic by linguists, written in Hebrew script, the way that Yiddish is a uh, sort of Germanic dialect written in Hebrew script. This material survived by chance in a shul, although of course it wasn't called a shul, it was called a kanisa um, in Arabic, it's the same root as Knesset, in the city of Kustat, Egypt. So now I'm gonna start showing my slides so you can see a nice picture of this synagogue. Um, can everybody see that? Josh, I'll just ask you to nod. Yes, okay, excellent. Yes, we can. Okay. So this is the present day exterior um, of the shul, of the synagogue. <laughs> um, this is the present day interior. And I actually just screenshotted this from this lovely virtual tour you can do online. If you just Google Ben Ezra Synagogue virtual tour, you can actually do this kind of uh, full spectrum, spectrum tour of the entire interior. Um, this interior was built in the 1890s. So this is not what it looked like in the Middle Ages. Um, however, that rebuilding project um, that gave us this interior has actually recently turned out to be very important to the Geniza's history, so it is worth looking at. Um, so what do I mean by that? So why was this material preserved in the synagogue? The truth is that we are actually not sure. Um, it survived in a small chamber within the old synagogue um, that predated this one that you're looking at. Um, that synagogue had probably existed in some form already by the 9th or early 10th century, or maybe even earlier. So the city of Fustat um, was built shortly after the Arab Islamic conquest of Egypt in the mid 7th century on the site of an old Roman fortress, which was called the Fortress of Babylon. In the Middle Ages, the period that we're talking about, many Jews and Christians still lived in the neighborhood where this fortress had stood. So this is the fortress, and now we're zooming in to see that there are a number of churches, one mosque, and at least one synagogue, all densely packed into this area. Um, our synagogue is this little blue square here, um, and it, as well as some of these churches, were actually built into the foundations of the old Roman fortress. We don't exactly know when a synagogue first went up here, but certainly sometime between um, the Arab Islamic conquests and the 10th century, probably in the 9th or 10th century, um, possibly even a little earlier. Um, but that synagogue, that old synagogue, was destroyed in the year 1012 as part of this kind of unique event, um, this 
Caliph al-Hakim, who's a very famous Caliph um, in the history of the Fatimid Empire, famous for doing many extremely unusual things, um, including destroying churches and synagogues throughout Egypt, um, including our synagogue. So the synagogue that was standing on that site was destroyed in 1012. Um, and then sometime after that, we have a document that actually talks about the rebuilding process in the 1020s or 30s. The synagogue was rebuilt, and then it stood intact until the 1890s. Um, throughout this period, members of the synagogue community had the practice, apparently, of placing their discarded writings in a small chamber within the building. So from the 1020s till the 1890s, you have people putting their writings into this little chamber. Now, this is just a kind of fanciful uh, reconstruction of what maybe it looked like. We don't actually know. Um, and we also don't actually know why they were doing this. So the working theory, which I'm sure you've all heard of and which everybody says when they ask, you know, whenever you ask anyone what the Geniza is, this is the answer, is that this was a practice of shameless. Of, you know, Jewish law has a taboo on casually discarding writings that have God's name on them or that are holy. Um, and that instead of burying them like we do today, these people's custom was to place their papers within this little chamber in the shul. So that makes a lot of sense, but we actually don't have any direct evidence that that's why these papers ended up there. It's really not clear. Um, there's no paper in the Geniza that tells us why this stuff is there or why people were putting it there. Um, and even if it is true, meaning even if this was a kind of Shamos chamber, um, the cache contained many, many texts that were not Jewish sacred writings. Um, moreover, there are smaller but similar caches of discarded texts that have been found in other places in the Middle East, including among Muslims and Christians. So this may have been a kind of wider cultural custom as opposed to really specifically tied um, to that element of Jewish law. Whatever the case is, um, over the course of the Middle Ages, and in particular in the 11th and 12th century, a tremendous amount of material was deposited here. Um, and over the subsequent centuries as well, we have kind of smaller pockets of material that people in this synagogue community seem to have continued to deposit at various points over time, um, discarded texts. By the 19th century, the chamber had become clogged with debris. And so in the 1890s, when the synagogue was rebuilt um, to make way for this lovely interior that I showed you at the beginning, um, and we'll just move back. So basically like this lovely reconstruction project that gave us this is why the Geniza came to light. It was opened up and the material was taken out and discovered. Um, all of that is actually relatively new information within the field. So even just a couple of years ago, when I gave introductions to the Geniza, I used to say that people in the synagogue community knew about the Geniza and it was just quote unquote discovered by European historians. Um, but that's actually now been shown to be probably not the case. There's a scholar named Rebecca Jefferson who's been doing amazing work, archival work on this. Um, and she's shown that it's really the demolition that brought the collection to light um, and in the process to the attention of Western scholars. Um, and it matters a lot to more than just the history of scholarship, it also matters to the history of the Geniza, because probably in the course of reconstruction, this material was badly damaged. So most of what we have in the Geniza are fragments, they're not whole codices or books, they're just kind of standalone leaves or little clusters of leaves, they're not in any kind of archived order, basically like a big giant mess. Um, and that's probably why, it's because of the process by which it was taken out of the synagogue. Um, once that happened, over the course of a number of years, collectors and scholars um, removed or purchased and removed, and now I should go back to um, here, uh, purchased and removed around 300,000, as I said, text and text fragments from the building, from its courtyard, and from a nearby cemetery, all of which kind of collectively came to be known as the Giza. Um, this is a really interesting story in its own right, told in this book that I've put up on the screen, Sacred Trash. Um, although the part I just told you about the demolition and how it damaged the material is not in this book because that's new. Um, but the backstory of the collections being taken out, et cetera, um, are in this book. This is like the most famous Geniza picture is Solomon Schechter sitting with the fragments, you know, in Cambridge University. And you can see the kind of state that they were in at that time. Okay, so what is in the Geniza? Um, the material contains huge, huge quantities of literary material, much of it Jewish literary material, but not only. Um, so there's tons and tons of liturgy. So probably the largest single um, subgroup in the Geniza is liturgical material, piyut, you know, bits of prayer books, um, standalone bits of prayers and sermons, which is not surprising since this was a room within a synagogue. Um, there are fragments of rabbinic works, theological works, responsa, 
but also works that are not Jewish or religious at all, um, works of science, philosophy, adab, or kind of the literature of the day. Um, and, and in addition to all of that literary stuff, there's somewhere between 30 to 40,000 everyday papers, or what historians call documents. And that's the material that I work on. Okay, so um, you can call these everyday papers, you can call these documents. There's things that are written for an immediate purpose for an immediate audience, as opposed to a work that's being written for a kind of undefined or infinite audience meant to be copied and passed down over time. Things like personal letters, so business letters, family letters, um, administrative letters, so communal officials writing to each other, people writing actually to officials in the Fatimid court, um, state decrees, um, tons of legal documents and court records, most of them produced by the Jewish courts of Fustat and sometimes Jewish courts elsewhere. Um, but there's also a small amount of Islamic legal documents produced by Qadis that either involve Jews or don't even involve Jews, but just somehow ended out there. And then many, many um, lists, including business and communal accounts, and also more miscellaneous kinds of lists. Um, geographically and chronologically, the core deposit um, is kind of from Fustat, where the synagogue is, and then like, moving out in a diffuse circle, you have also quite a bit of material from elsewhere in Egypt, a lot of stuff from Syria, um, and then less but still significant amounts of stuff um, from North Africa moving out towards Ephrathia, present day Tunisia, and also some stuff from Sicily, which was under Fatimid control for a while. Um, there's also little smatterings of things even further out, you know, from all the way from Europe to Central Asia, but that, that's quite rare. Really, most of it is from, you know, this core region and then a little bit over here. Um, and then the core kind of chronological material is from the Fatimid and Ayyubid periods from a, around 1000 to around 1250. That's the material I work on. I don't go past 1250 for the most part. Occasionally I do, if it's, you know, especially kind of ties into something in my core time period. There's later material that I don't work with at all from the early and even later Ottoman period, which has actually been understudied and is starting to attract attention now. Um, oh, the last thing I wanted to say about this is this year 1000. So um, there's kind of a misperception that there's older material in the Geniza than this. Um, as I told you, the synagogue that this chamber uh, was built into was built in the 1020s. The oldest manuscripts um, that were placed in it really don't seem to be more than a century older than that, which makes sense. Like that's the oldest stuff that people still had around to, to put in um, from the 10th century. Um, there is, of course, material that like the texts themselves are older. In fact, very famously, some texts from the Second Temple period, some texts that we only know elsewhere from the Dead Sea Scrolls ended up in the Geniza, but not on ancient manuscripts. The manuscripts themselves are probably all 10th century um, or later with maybe a few exceptions, but nothing dated that's older than that. Okay, this is a completely remarkable collection. Um, the documents, the literary stuff is remarkable as well, but I work with the documents, so I want to tell you why the documents are remarkable. Um, these are not the only documents that we have from the pre-modern Middle East. It's not that we don't have stuff like this elsewhere. Actually, quite a lot of documents have survived from the Middle East and specifically from Egypt because of its dry climate. So documents on kind of hard surfaces like clay and stone have survived from Mesopotamia, um, from Iran, from Egypt, um, from lots of places. Um, but material that's on more kind of fragile writing surfaces, um, papyrus and then paper and parchment, um, which is what was used in late antiquity and then in the Middle Ages, which tend to survive better in drier climates, have survived in greater numbers in Egypt. Um, and we also have more of them because of the history of excavations in Egypt. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of like where the Geniza fits into the history of Middle Eastern documents overall, um, most of what we have is from Egypt. There's stuff from Syria. If we go all the way back to the Ptolemaic period, which is, you know, um, uh, later by Ashimi period, you know, there's tremendous amounts of material in Greek from Egypt, some stuff in Aramaic, some stuff in Demotic, which is a um, Egypt, Egyptian language script, a little bit in Latin, then moving into the um, seventh and eighth centuries during and after the Arab Islamic conquest. There's a lot of material in Coptic, and then there's an explosion of documents in Arabic. So the Geniza is this little bubble of Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic here. So you kind of place the Geniza against the big map of documents that we have. It doesn't look that exciting, um, but it actually is. Um, and this is why. The Geniza documents are unique, even among all these other groups of documents, um, for a few reasons. First of all, the documentary Geniza is the single largest coherent group of documents like this that we have. So despite the damage that I mentioned earlier, even with all the kind of depredations that the Geniza documents were subject to when they were taken out of the chamber, they're still much better preserved than a lot of what we have, um, in part because they're on paper and parchment as opposed to papyrus. 
So the earlier material um, from late antiquity, this, this, sorry, let me go this way, this stuff that's on, you know, Greek, Aramaic, etc., um, as well as the Coptic material and the early earliest Arabic material is on a writing surface called papyrus, which is made of leaves of the papyrus plant. Um, so I show I'm, I chose an especially falling apart example to show you. Um, they're not all this bad, but um, papyrus does tend to kind of fall apart like this. It's very fragile. So a lot of the late ancient papyri are not that well preserved as compared to um, the Ganesa material. Um, so it's the largest group, it's relatively well preserved. And then really the most important thing about it is that it's a very dense, but also very varied corpus. So what I mean by that is we have a tremendous variety of document types in the Geniza, letters, legal documents, accounts, all of them produce, you know, not by a single group of people, but by a kind of overlapping interconnected set of people. Um, some of whom are very well represented within the corpus and we have like hundreds of letters by certain merchants, but even when that's not the case, we can still kind of trace these groups over time, um, which allows us to kind of see these people um, from many different angles of vision, like the same types of people, sometimes even the same actual people as they're trading, as they're seeking charity, as they're interacting with their family members, as they're going to court, as they're interacting with state officials. Um, this is a kind of scale of view that we just don't have for any of those other corpora that I just showed you. Um, final thing I wanna talk about before we get into some documents, who are the people that the Geniza illuminates? So who are these people? Okay. Um, mostly the Geniza shows us Jews, but not exclusively. We also get glimpses of Christians. Um, Egypt still had a huge Christian population in this period and of Muslims, um, especially Muslim state officials, but not only, both indirectly and through actual like uh, documents that were produced for Christians and Muslims that survived. Um, but it's mostly Jews or people who are somehow involved with Jews and make their way in peripherally. Um, this Jewish population is a very urban population and it's very what I would call cosmopolitan in some ways. And so to explain what I mean by that, I'm going to take a step back and briefly set the stage historically, and then I'll be done with my introduction. Okay, so just a little bit of historical background. Okay, so in the Roman period, before the period that we're looking at now, the period of, you know, Chazal, you could say, um, what we now think of as the Middle East was ruled by two different empires. And I apologize, this is a terrible map because whoever drew it for some reason decided to use two almost identical shades to show the two empires. I don't know why, but the kind of more mustardy yellow over here is the Roman empire and the beige over here is the Sasanian empire. And you can kind of plug this into your Judaic knowledge by thinking of the Yerushalmi over here and the Bavli over here. Um, in the seventh century, both regions were conquered by a group of people um, who came from Arabia. Um, down here, uh, the Arab conquest or the Islamic conquest or the Arab Islamic conquest, every single one of these terms is contested for reasons that are not relevant to us at the moment, um, and establish an empire across this whole region. Um, and there are two successive empires that rule over, you know, much of the Middle East, first the Umayyads and then the Abbasids. Um, all of this matters because there is a kind of a uh, series of massive social and cultural changes that happen in the ninth and 10th centuries, especially under this second dynasty, the Abbasids. Um, and this is all just before the period we're looking at when we look at the Giza. So you can think of this as kind of, you know, post Ghazal, what happens? Um, there's, after the conquests, there's a kind of period when things don't change that fast socially. And then there's these massive, massive changes that occur in the ninth and 10th centuries. And I've just put a few of them on the slide um, and you can, follow where my cursor is here. So first of all, there is urbanization across the entire Caliphate, both new cities being built, such as Fustat, that's one of these, well, it's, it's not new to the Abbasid period, but it grows tremendously. Um, it is new to the Islamic period and older cities being cultivated and people moving into them. There's a lot of geographic mobility. So people moving around from one end of the Caliphate to the other. Um, there's widespread linguistic change. Um, people are starting to use Arabic both in writing and in speaking in large numbers. And by the ninth century, with a couple of major exceptions, the whole region has really become Arabic speaking. Um, the major, major ex exception is Persian, but that's not relevant to Egypt. Um, there's also Islamization. So um, Islam likely becomes a majority religion by the ninth, ninth century in many regions, and even where it's not, which is likely the case in Egypt, Egypt is still probably majority Christian, 
um, Islam is still now the kind of dominant like cultural presence, so to speak. Um, and finally, there's a massive literary revolution that happens during this period, just a massive outpouring of books in Arabic, which include works that are being translated from Greek, often via Syriac, into Arabic. So the whole kind of legacy of the Hellenistic world gets translated into Arabic, an outpouring of Arabic literature and of new genres, um, including religious genres, Islamic law, theology, and exegesis, all of which gets taken up by Jews and Christians and, as well. Jews and Christians develop similar genres of writing. So all of this happens under the Abbasids in the 9th and 10th century. In the mid 10th century, the Abbasid empire fractures. It gives way to kind of other smaller empires and states, the most important of whom are the Fatimids who are ruling over Egypt, okay? And that brings us to our Geniza people. So the Geniza people are living in the Fatimid empire after all of this has happened. And by the time we get to this point, Jews are like fully participating in all of these changes that have happened. Um, Jews are urban. They seem mainly to live in cities. They're not rural so far as we can tell through the Geniza or other sources that we have, at least in Egypt and Syria. They're very mobile. So especially men move around a lot. And this isn't just an elite phenomenon. You have very poor people moving around as well, seeking charity. Um, they're communicating with each other across vast regions in writing. Um, they're speaking Arabic, they're participating in Islamic hate, political and literary culture. So all of this kind of cultural explosion that's happened in the Abbasid period, Jews are taking part in it. Um, some elite Jews are deeply embedded within high level political networks at the Fatimid court, but even much more kind of lower level Jews are still part of this common culture that is shared across the Fatimid empire and really across the entire Middle East. Um, all that said, Jews are also distinctive in that they form coherent social communities that are marked by religion that really affect their social identities in a lot of ways, both from above in terms of how the state treats them and from below in terms of how people aggregate themselves. Um, Jews seem mostly to only marry other Jews, although this may be part of, partly an evidence bias where we don't see Jews who um, who leave the community and who you know marry non-Jews or convert as well. Um, and they're still writing in Hebrew script. Okay, so that was all kind of a brief introduction to who these people are. Um, a much better and richer introduction is given in a series of books by a scholar named S.D. Goitein, who is the kind of founding father of my field of Geniza social history. Um, this came out in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, but it is still just a wonderful read. Um, and like, if you're interested in reading more about the Geniza, it's really where I would start because it's just, so much fun. Um, and there are five volumes. I put the one about the family up. There's a volume on economic history, on the community, on the family, on material culture, and on the individual. Um, that said, the field has developed and done more things since Goitein. Um, and there's been a series of kind of recent works in the last two decades on lots of interesting aspects of social, cultural, and religious history based on these documents. Um, and that's sort of the field that I belong to. Um, I had said this was the last thing, but I guess there's one more thing I want to say, which is just how can you look at or access Geniza documents? Um, the Geniza documents today are scattered across dozens of libraries and private collections in the United States, Europe, and Israel. The largest collection of documentary material is at Cambridge University, um, and a lot of it is online. 90%, I would say, is online. Um, there's a website, the Friedberg Geniza Project. Um, the address is jewishmanuscripts.org that has high resolution digital images as well as searchable catalog records and bibliography for about 90% of the material. Um, many of the individual libraries also have their own websites and the Princeton Geniza project, which I'm involved with has metadata, sort of kind of like descriptions um, searchable in English of many of the documents. Okay, so that's it for my introduction. It took more than 10, 15 minutes, but we still have some time. Um, what I want to do now is actually look at some documents together. So I told you the documents are really interesting. Now I want to show you that the documents are really interesting. Um, and the kind of loose thread that I used for tying together what I would choose to show you is everyday Judaism. So what I mean by this is I'm just going to show you a few documents that demonstrate practices that made up people's belonging in the Jewish community or that were marked as Judaism. And I don't really mean ritual. Um, besides liturgy, which we do have a lot of, but not in the documentary end and the literary end, um, the Geniza is not a great source for understanding you know, how people kept kosher or how they tied their tzitzit. That's not the kind of information that it shows you. It's a little bit on kosher cheese, but it's not that interesting once you get beyond the like, cool, it's a hatcher. Um, what it does show you a lot better, this material, 
is aspects of public or social religion. So how Jews related to each other within communal institutions, including some that were really intimately involved in central aspects of people's lives. Um, so I have three themes that I'm gonna illustrate, charity, marriage, um, and then a couple of last documents that are about kind of like public religiosity. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna try to do now is ask people to unmute and we'll see if we can get a conversation going. And if it devolves into mayhem, then um, somebody from the shul's end will step in and help moderate. Okay, so the first couple of documents, actually I'll, I'll pause first and say, does anybody have questions about anything I just said? Because I'm just speaking into the void. I don't know how clear that all was. Um, I don't mean like big thought questions, but just clarification questions. Everybody's good? I can't so there, there, was, there was a question written in the chat. I don't know if okay. you saw it or not. No, I can't. Um, right somebody, okay, so somebody asked what language all of these documents are in. Ah, okay, so the vast you majority- responded to it right afterwards. Oh, I did? Okay, well, that was- a, That was a happy accident. So the Geniza um, documents, so there is some Arabic script material and there are actually all kinds of weird languages in the, in the Geniza as kind of like one-offs. Um, but the vast majority of the stuff is in Hebrew script and it's either in Hebrew, um, occasionally Aramaic, although usually just in legal documents, there's isolated formulas in Aramaic. Um, and most of it is in Judeo-Arabic. So Arabic written in Hebrew script. Then there's also a smaller group of Arabic script, Arabic documents. Um, but we're, we're going to look today at Judeo-Arabic and Hebrew. I tried to choose Hebrew things so that you can, if you're interested, look them up later and actually read them yourself in the manuscript online. Okay, um, so the first couple of things that we're going to look at have to do with charity. Um, and they come from this wonderful book, The Voice of the Poor in the Middle Ages, which um, the leading scholar of the Geniza, Mark Cohn, wrote a couple of years ago. Um, and the first thing that I want to show you is, um, this is actually, let's see if you can figure out what it is. So this is what it looks like. It's a list and you can tell it's got the characteristic format of a list because it's folded in the middle. Um, and there are entries which have little numbers with a dot over them. Um, and here I just translated the first column. Okay, so I don't know, is it legible? Can you see the, the text? Yes, okay. So if you look up here, there's a bet, chin, a mem. Um, that's short for Bishimcha, um, and probably Rachmecha would have followed, so, or maybe Rachmana, so in the merciful one's name. So this is a Jewish version of the Bismillah the, um, that starts, you know, almost all genres of Arabic writing. Um, and then you have a, a kind of entry here. Friday, the 8th of Av, so that's in Judeo-Arabic but I'm actually gonna show with my cursor the Hebrew part now, min chodesh av, and that's what I've translated here. May its morning be turned into joy. Dispense to the poor, may God in his mercy make them rich. Um, six was written and then pressed out, and then it says four and a half pars of bread, which is a measurement, and uh, Cohen worked this out to about 450 pounds of bread. Okay, so what is this? Anybody? Donation. It's a it's a list of How bread that, <laughs> to each person. Exactly, it's a list of who came to get bread that was being dispensed to the poor, and we have quite a few lists like this. Um, Cohen edited some of them. There are even more than what he edited. They're always dated. Um, they were associated with uh, the synagogue community. Um, and they're lists of the people who came to get bread, usually twice a week. Um, we don't have for every week throughout the Middle Ages. We have just kind of like little slices of this practice. Um, so just a, a word about this. Um, so we know that the Jewish community was organized both in kind of like synagogue communities and also the community of the city as a whole kept a communal chest or, or, or kind of like funds. Um, and there are also donor lists where you see members of the community giving money to be used for various charitable purposes. And then we have lists of how the money was used, most commonly bread and second most commonly to give out clothing. Um, this is a social context where we don't have uh, public welfare in the sense that we you know, understand it now. Um, the Fatimid Caliphs do give out sort of charitable uh, 
uh, things of various kinds on their own, but it's not necessarily at a population-wide level. Um, and Jews seem to be turning really to the Jewish community um, for this kind of charity, which already gives you one important piece of information about how communal cohesion is working in the society, in part through this kind of practice of uh, having the wealthier members of the community give money and then the poorer members of the community come and take. Um, beyond that, the lists give us an incredible amount of information. So who are some of the people that we see just in this one little column of this one random list that I picked out of the many that Cohen edits? Um, so we have the orphans of the astrologer, um, the man from Acker. Okay, so it's not just people from Fustat, there are people from elsewhere who are coming to take bread. A bunch of people named only by their first names, um, which uh, tells us that- which tells us that this was a small enough community that um, you could kind of just give your name um, and somehow be known. Um, anything else that anybody notices about this list that's interesting? They took care of the deaf and the blind mm -hmm. and the orphans. Yeah, disabilities, physical disabilities, social disabilities that are marked in this way um, are written down. Um, sometimes in lieu of a name or in addition to a name. There was a Karite community. Yeah. What are Karites? So Karites- Very literal interpretations. Yeah, Karites of, are, of uh, it's, it's a medieval Jewish movement that is uh, self-consciously anti-rabbinic. So um, Karite Jews reject rabbinic tradition. Um, there are kind of Karite communal institutions of some kind. Um, one of the most interesting works of Geniza social history that's been written in the last few decades by actually a colleague of mine, a senior colleague of mine, Marina Rusto, is on relationships between the Karites and the Rabbinites in Fustat. And she shows that when you look at the literary works, these people are just yelling at each other nonstop from morning until evening, calling each other heretics. When you look at material like this, you get a very different picture. Um, they are forming communal institutions together and you have somebody, he is marked as a Karaite, so this is a kind of, this is a Rabbinite synagogue, but um, he's coming to get, his orphans are coming to get bread here as well. Um, two more things I want to note about this list. Is there, is there a possibility that there's some non-Jews altogether, like um, abide? Sounds almost- Yeah, that's a great question. Um, probably not. Um, if that were the case, I would expect it to be marked, and I've never seen that. And women have, actually, everybody has Arabic names um, in this population. Men also have Hebrew names and they tend to kind of switch back and forth like, like in Russian novels, um, sometimes even within a single legal document, um, you have Ibrahim turns into Abraham, um, but women only have Arabic names. So, so that's probably a Jewish woman. Um, if it was a Christian or a Muslim, it probably would say so, um, usually in documents uh, that are in Judeo-Arabic, it's noted when you're talking about somebody who's not Jewish. But there is um, a Rivka. Listed. There is a Rivka, right. So that's actually one of the things I was going to point out. There's a Rivka and she shows up right next to the female washer of the dead of the room, which is either the Byzantine Empire or Europe. So this is very interesting. Um, she's almost certainly not from Egypt, Rivka. Um, almost certainly she's from either the Byzantine Empire or Europe and she's shown up with this other woman who also is. Final thing that I will note about this list and then I'll stop and see if anybody has other observations. Uh, by the way, just at a graphic level, um, you can make out, did I say this? You can make out where the names are and where the amounts are. Um, there's all sorts of things that theoretically historians could do with these lists, which they haven't, like try to calculate, you know, what sizes of households these people are living in, right? Because they're given different amounts of bread, presumably based on the amount of people in their household that they're going back to feed. Um, but I once wrote in, in my book, I wrote a section on uh, norms around women's mobility in public and mixing in public um, you know, when men are around. And one thing that I realized is these lists are great evidence for that too, because what is not happening in these lists in terms of gender segregation? They're not, they aren't segregated. No apparent segregation. I mean, the way I visualize this happening is that you have people lined up to get bread and the scribe is writing down their names as they get it and it's men and women completely intermixed. Okay, next document. Actually, no, let me stop. Does anybody have other things you'd like to note about this document? I have has a question. Anybody, has anybody worked to improve the, uh, the, 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 liter, 
the visual quality of these documents? If somebody uh, scanned them in and tried to clean them up, so to speak? What you're looking at is the kind of best, best images we have. <laughs> um, there are so many documents in the Geniza that there's, it's not like the Dead Sea Scrolls with tiny corpus that many people are working on each piece. So unless it's a really high profile item, um, people are not actively doing that. This is actually pretty good, honestly, mm -hmm. as, as these documents go. Uh, everything on this page is legible. Another question about the uh, two notations for Um Mataya and Um uh, Bayad. Is Um like Ima Shell? Yeah, exactly. Uh, is this yes. the mother yes. of the person? Yes, yes. And, this is, uh, the, yes. and this is an Arabic naming convention, exactly. So another question. On one hand, you were saying you visualized this as people lining up and just running down as they come in to get. And on the other hand, you said, but look how Rivka is listed next to the female washer of the dead. Is there? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm just making things up when I say that. I, we don't know. <laughs> as the thing about documents is they give you amazing windows into real life, but they don't let you see beyond the window. So we actually, we have no description of this process. We don't know. I'm simply imagining that maybe because it's striking that these both appear to be non-Egyptian sort of people from outside um, the Islamic Arabic speaking world. I'm just imagining that maybe these women showed up together, but that's not a recurring pattern. So I was just being somewhat fanciful, but it is true that um, when you get a Hebrew name, it's almost always a tell that she's not um, sort of native, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so next document. Okay, this is a different kind of document um, that uh, that uh, shows us stuff about charity, and it's a different kind of charity. Um, this is um, actually that's not true. Usually, these are private. They're private petitions where somebody is writing to someone asking them for money. But this one that I've shown you is a petition asking that a communal charity drive be undertaken. But I chose it because it's just such interesting, evocative, tragic language. Um, so it starts out with some, um, and this is in Hebrew. That's the other reason I chose it. So anybody who wants to look this up later, you can go to the Cambridge University Library's Geniza site, or you can go to Friedberg, uh, jewishmanuscripts.org. You can put in this shelf mark, um, and you can look at this picture and read it yourself, because it's in Hebrew. So it starts out with three bib biblical verses that are all about the virtue of charity. Um, that's a very common, actually universal thing in these charity petitions. They all start out that way. So that already tells us something about the embeddedness of um, uh, Judaism in this communal culture. Um, and uh, then it starts with a very typical kind of address to um, this communal leader. So he's being called the great Nasi, head of the diasporas, blah, blah, blah. But what he really is, is an important Jewish leader in Fustat. Um, to your honor, greatness, and oops, sorry. To your honor, greatness, and holiness, the excellent diadem and crown and good name from on high, blah, 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 blah. That's who's being addressed. Okay, now this is the part I want to focus in on. Your slave woman, she's not a slave. People in petitions, in Arabic language petitions, call themselves slaves whenever they are addressing somebody who is sort of socially higher up on the social scale than them, which is always the case if you're petitioning someone, you're asking someone for a favor. Um, this is in... Islamic Arabic language petitions, and also in Jewish, Judeo-Arabic, and Hebrew petitions. So it's just a formula. It's an interesting, important formula, but she's not actually a slave. What she is, according to herself, is poor, wretched, woeful, worried, and afflicted on account of my sins. Uh, many in, are my sins, and my heart is sick. I'm on my own. I have neither husband, nor son, nor daughter, nor brother, nor sister, and I wander about like a lonesome bird on a rooftop. Okay, so most of this is very common in women's petitions. Um, women present themselves when they are writing someone for help, when they are writing a Jewish communal leader for help, which is usually the only person they write, they always stress that they have no kinship ties, they have no relatives, they have no, nobody who can help them. But this phrase, I wander about like a lonesome bird on a rooftop, which is actually from Tehillim, I have never seen something like that before. It really stands out for its poetic qualities. Um, and then she tells this incredibly tragic story. Because my sins and iniquities multiplied, I became afflicted on my nose. Then the malady spread. My face became wasted and eaten away. The disease gets work, worse and worse, and I cannot work. Um, I'm naked, thirsty, and destitute, and have no means of sustenance. Those are also all very typical formulas. Nobody takes care of me, even if I were to die. She means that even if she died, nobody would pay for her shrouds and her burial. Um, 
And then she says she casts herself down before the Lord, that is God, and my Lord, that is the person she's writing to, um, so that you might take pity on me in your kindness and act towards me for the sake of the Lord, et cetera. And then she asks him to order um, Ixika, like a communal charity collection, um, wherever he wants, either in Cairo or in, it's not clear here what she means, Al Medina, she, the city, um, so that I may be given compassion and respite. Okay, so we have a lot of petitions um, that look somewhat like this. This is just an exceptionally kind of poetic and striking one, which is why I chose it, which give us a different view into poverty and charity, where you have poor Jews petitioning communal officials or petitioning wealthier Jews in the community to help them um, and telling often very, very tragic stories um, about their lives, always prefaced by biblical verses um, and always giving this kind of like same picture when it comes to women, that the woman has nobody except for God and the person that she is writing to. One thing that I find really interesting about this petition and a few other petitions like it is the kind of theology that's embedded in here. It keeps on saying, because my sins and iniquities multiplied. Um, so there's this kind of theology that all of these terrible things have happened to her because of her sins. What's quite striking about this is, do you think that this woman wrote this herself? Like if you had to guess? I, well, I would say the level of education myself. that most women received at the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she. This is such a coherent letter. I don't think anyone who's you know halfway uh, knowledgeable in Hebrew would have difficulty reading this entire letter and recognizing the psukim. Exactly, That's a beautiful handwriting. Exactly, yes. I'm amazed. I mean, yeah. I, I've seen uh, 18th century documents that much more illegible than this. Yeah, I, I always say like I'm glad I work on the Geniza because I love the material, but also if you try to read Arabic script documents, they're completely illegible. So like I already have a step up in terms of easiness. No, she didn't write this. This is a professional scribe who wrote this like a hundred percent. It's the handwriting, it's the verses, and it's the formulas. Were um, there people who basically their job was to be the interlocutor, so to speak, and, and write for people who needed this? This is one of the most interesting questions that these petitions pose. Um, it seems like there must have been. We know there are communal scribes who are writing legal documents. Some of them, we know their handwriting really well because they left hundreds of legal documents in the Geniza. They were working for the synagogue court for the Beit Din and writing documents. Um, usually those people are not the people who are writing these petitions, and it's completely unclear how somebody like this would have, you know, paid for a document like this. Maybe writing it itself was an act of charity. We don't know. So that's one of the major questions um, that is really interesting. There's a kind of whole protocol here, which I should say, by the way, is mimicking the way that people relate to the Fatimid state and the Ayyubid state as well. Um, so I just mentioned Marina Resto's book on Karaites and Rabbinites. Her latest book, which just came out, is on state petitions, on people um, petitioning the Fatimid state for justice or for help with things. Um, and there's a whole kind of protocol where it's scribes writing the petitions and scribes writing the decrees and they follow very elaborate formulas. It's kind of similar thing just on a much more humble lower scale happening in the Jewish community. And it's clear that there are professional scribes doing this, whether as a act of charity or as a kind of very small side business, it's not clear. But she definitely had this written for her. Um, which makes this kind of theology about how all of these things that happened to her are her own fault very poignant and troubling, um, I think, from a human perspective. Um, okay, so those are two little windows into charity. There's a lot more we could say about this, but I want to move on to marriage because there's going to be even more to say when we get there. Um, and then depending on whether we have time, we'll get to the last two. Okay, so I work on marriage in particular, among other things, but marriage is a subject I've spent a lot of time with, and I'm showing you two of uh, my favorite documents in Hebrew that have to do with marriage. Um, so a couple of things to say about marriage. So marriage is one of the main spheres of Jewish life that the Beit Din regulates, um, sort of like today, except much more so. Um, marriage is a different institution in many ways from the marriage that we, uh, marriages that we know now. Um, and the marriage contract is a much more living document. And so are other legal agreements surrounding marriage, in part because marriage itself is a more contractual relationship. Um, there's a high rate of divorce. Um, it's sort of not thought of necessarily in the same way that th we think of marriage nowadays. 
Um, and people write up marriage agreements that are very specific and very concrete about what each person legally owes the other within the marriage. Um, and this is a very colorful one. So this is not a ktuba, it's not a ksuba. It's a premarital agreement that is just standing on its own where the groom is making a whole bunch of promises to his father-in-law. So it starts with a bunch of legal formulas, which I just gave you a snippet of. So it starts with Zikron Edut, a record of testimony, which is a common form of Hebrew legal document that occurred before us, we the witnesses who signed below. And again, you can read this all in Hebrew if you go to um, Cambridge's website or Friedberg and you type in the shelf mark 20.160. Okay. So the groom, Tovia ben Ali ben Khalaf, stood before, said before us, and then he says, be my witnesses, perform Kenyan with me effective immediately, write and sign about me with every expression of rights, and give it to this guy, Shlomo has a cane ben Netanel. So this is all standard boilerplate formulary, but what it tells us that's important is that this is a document that this guy is narrating in order to give it to this guy. And this guy is his father-in-law. So this is actually a set of legal promises that this man is making to his future father-in-law. And let's see what he is promising. Before I marry her, that from the time this Faiza enters my home, that's the bride, I will behave with her as good, proper sons of Israel, behave with proper daughters of Israel. And the word I'm translating as proper is kasher. Um, to pave righteous paths and to abandon subversion and perverseness. I will associate with proper men and not with corrupt men. I will not bring into my house licentious men, buffoons, frivolous gestures, or good for nothings. I will not enter the house of anyone who clings to licentiousness, corruption, and ugly deeds. I won't associate with them for food or drink or anything else. And finally, I will not buy myself a slave woman as long as this Faiza is with me in marriage, except with her explicit consent. Okay, so this is not hard to read between the lines. What is going on here? Anybody? He probably, had, he probably has a somewhat unsavory past. <laughs> yeah, does not sound like this man very much trusts his son-in-law to be. Um, the actual least unusual part of this is the part that probably stands out to you guys and to me as a modern person as the most shocking, which is this slave woman clause. Um, what is this promise about? A concubine. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, this is a there. This is a slaveholding society. And I don't just mean Jews, uh, everybody, um, Muslims and Christians, too. Um, and uh, th this is a common practice of putting into marriage contracts that the, the husband promises not to buy or to keep a female slave if his wife objects. And you've got to assume um, there's um, a sexual uh, subtext here, especially because in Islamic law, men have sexual access to uh, their female slaves. So that is a cultural norm. It's not permitted in Jewish law, but that is what we assume is going on with these clauses. That's actually a typical clause. The rest of this is completely atypical. Um, all of these promises, like this is not typical at all. You have to assume that it's really, you know, because of this man's character. Um, and so obviously the question this raises is why this man, the father-in-law would marry his daughter off to somebody like this. And we don't know, but um, it's a really kind of striking document. It looks like a, a real, um, almost a financial um, contractual agreement. You yeah. can see some of the lines, the, the mem sofit on some lines are extended to fill the whole line so as to mm -hmm. prevent counterfeiting. Yep. So that looks like something that would be brought to a court, a bait in or something yep. if necessary yep. to prove, you know, here's, here's my agreement and here's how, how much, you know, I expect or whatever it is. Yeah. Exactly. And we, ha we have, I mean, this is a known genre of pre-marriage agreements and there's a whole literature actually um, about like what exactly happened if the husband didn't live up to it or if the wife didn't live up to her promises. Um, and usually what it hinged on was the wife being able to get a divorce with financial compensation as opposed to not. There is, by the way, um, an aguna problem in this society, but it's different from what we think of as the aguna problem. It's men just kind of leaving town and leaving their wives um, altogether. Um, but these agreements more have to do with the finances that divorce. But yeah, it's it's a it's a beautifully written, serious legal document with all the forms and, as you say, all the graphic forms as well that make it legitimate. Um, and the, the content is just really surprising. Um, 
okay. Well, is this a glimpse into life in those days? <laughs> well, sure, of course. <laughs> Uh, but it's not typical. It's it's unusual. It's it's striking because we don't have a lot of contracts that have terms like this. So you, it's kind of the interplay between stuff that is familiar and that we know about in the society, and you know, particular personal cases of this man and his you know unsavory ways. Um, Mordechai Friedman, who published this contract, called it you know contracts with grooms of questionable character. Um, okay, um, the people in charge should tell me when we're running out of time. I don't know how much time was budgeted for this, but I'll show you at least one more and then we can take stock and do the last couple ones or not. Um, okay, this is also a marriage agreement, but this is a different stage of marriage um, and you'll be able to see what it is as I read. This has less legal form formulary. It's from an earlier period. This is actually one of the few pre-1012 documents. So it comes from before the synagogue was rebuilt probably from the late 10th or early 11th century from a city in the Fayum, which is away from the capital in the north of Egypt. Um, it's also in Hebrew and it starts this way. So Masa shehayal ufanenu, so a, court, a case or Masa that occurred before us. Same thing though as before, we the witnesses signed below, then there's the date. Um, well, yeah, I should say, it's, it's really Madinat Piton, but that's like a Hebrew version for the Fayum. Okay, then there's this, reference to a chuva that was sent to the Av Beit Din. We don't exactly know who they're talking about, but I think it has to do with people in this city communicating with communal officials in his staff. That's not important for our purposes. Okay, this man, Ibrahim Ben Salam, and his wife, and the marriage contract that she tore. So we're missing a little bit of the backstory, and that's because over here it's a face. Um, but somehow this woman tore up her ksuba. She tore up her marriage contract, and then she regretted it. She came before us, that is before the witnesses, saying, I've sinned, make peace between us. Um, she cried, she and her son. So this is not a young woman. She's old enough to have a son who's old enough to come with her to kind of back her up. Um, before the Jews, so it's this kind of communal group of people in this town. And they pressured, now here we have that slippage. His name is Ibrahim, but here he's called Abraham, her husband, and said to him, why won't you accept her? Okay. So what's happened, this woman has gotten so presumably enraged at her husband that she tore up her marriage contract. And now she's really in trouble because she has no marriage rights without it. So she comes and she is weeping before these communal sort of leaders, whoever they are, with her son. And they're pressuring her husband to take her back um, and asking him why he won't. And he said to them, she shamed me and the people of my household and my brother and sister and their children and all my relatives. We investigated these claims and found them to be true. Okay, that's the backstory. Now, this is the content of the agreement that they write up. So basically what this is, is a contract that is being written to take the place of her tuba, of her tuba that she tore up. And it's terrible. <laughs> these are the terms that they dictate to her. She will stand before him when he enters and leaves. She will serve and honor him. As long as she is pure, she will not refuse the household he needs. Now I need to just parenthetically say, I just wrote a whole article on this. This is a weird custom that people in Egypt seem to have practiced of women secluding themselves when they were menstruating out of a kind of quasi-biblical, pseudo-biblical, non-rabbinic belief in menstrual uh, like contagion, that an impure, that a nida woman can make other people impure by touching their things or making them food. These are not Karaites, these are Rabbinites, but this is a practice that seems to be kind of widespread in Egypt. And this is the earliest evidence we have for it actually with this clause. Anyway, um, however, when that's not the case, she won't refuse the household he needs, which means she'll do her housework. When she sees him distressed, she won't respond to him with arguments. If she needs clothing or important garments, she will ask him only for what he can afford. <laughs> she won't shame him with evil, disgraceful or scornful words, nor his relatives. She'll only mention them according to their honor. She won't defy him with improper words or deeds. She won't leave his house without his permission. She won't ask him to go to Fustat or anywhere else without his permission. Uh, finally, she will honor and value and serve him. She won't sit idly in the house, not performing her work in flax and wool, nor fulfilling any of the household needs, nor baking and cooking. Okay, she agrees to all of these with a kinyan, which is a you know rabbinic legal act that you're all very familiar with, but in this period in contracts, it acts as a kind of validation of the legal act or testimony in the contract. Um, if at any time she rebels and refuses to abide by any of these conditions, he will be exempt from paying her her dower, meaning he can just divorce her, owe her no money at all and send her on her way. Um, 
And then there's some formulary here that actually comes straight out of the ketubah of the day. Um, okay, so what position has this woman been put in by this group of Jewish elders, possibly acting as a bait team? A position of servitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A quick like, question. Did she physically tear the kasuba or did she breach the contract? No, she tore it up, it sounds like. That's not a euphemism. Okay. No, correct. It's not just servitude, it's like performative servitude. You know, she has to stand up for him when he comes into the room. She has to speak of him honorably. But you also get little like hints slave. of what? Like a slave. Maybe. I mean, we don't have a lot of evidence for how slaves were expected to act within households. But yes, yeah, certainly a kind of performative submissiveness to him. And then you get little hints of their actual human relationship, right? She won't ask him to go to Kustat. <laughs> They're off in this town in the Fayum. This has presumably been a source of conflict in their marriage. If she needs clothing or important garments, she will ask him only for what he can afford. Um, so part of why I wanted to show you, you this is just because it's such a striking, you know, amazing contract. This is also quite unusual. You have legal agreements, renegotiating marriages. This is the most extreme of any that I've ever seen of this kind of like woman having to submit herself in this way. And yet it echoes in an extreme form, kind of some ideas about marriage that we do get in other material. Um, it's a very interesting interplay between things that we know are documentary norms. So ways in which contracts are usually written, Jewish norms of the day that we recognize, right? The Kenyan, the kind of language from the Ksuba that's over here um, and stuff that seems very uh, idiosyncratic. And so the interpretive challenge here is, is this just a guy who's, you know, like a petty tyrant and he's making this up and it's, you know, out of the norm? Or is this a cultural norm for this particular time and place that we otherwise don't see um, in the Geniza? So. Um, Goitain, who mentioned, I think he gave a translation of this contract in a Mediterranean society. He said, this is, you know, an image of a, you know, small-minded man trying to gain power over a strong woman who, you know, didn't want to accept the rural norms of the place where uh, she moved to. But the truth is, this woman, you know, she may have been strong inside, but she had no power at all um, at this point. Mm -hmm. Sorry. What about Rambam? Just at the same time as the Rambam writes that women have to uh, wash their feet and, and hands of the husband, it's, it's, it sounds like it's the same stuff. Well, What's yeah, the Rambam is writing that a couple centuries later, but he's also an outlier, meaning, yes, you're right, you're right, um, but he's an outlier. This is that, that passage, which is very, very famous, is not echoed in most of the Geniza material. Um, this contract is one of the very few places that you see something like this in such full flower. Oh my gosh, it's nine o'clock already. All right, so I had two more little documents about kind of like funny things about public religion, but we could stop and just have general questions or we could do the last two. I don't know how tired people are getting. I, uh, I, I noticed that the participant number is slowly trickling downwards. So I, I think that's our cue to wrap up. Okay, so let's wrap up. I'll stop the share um, and I will be happy to take, you know, just for a few minutes um, questions. I, I did see a, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so first question uh, is, can you describe how the, the documents got to so many different countries? Yeah. So, I mean, all the documents that end up in the Geniza are, you know, passing through Egypt at some point. Many of them come from elsewhere. Um, not surprisingly, the genre that most often comes from elsewhere are letters that are sent to people in Egypt. But you have other material, you have legal documents and other things that occasionally show up. Um, so they either got there with a person who was, you know, bringing them along or they got there through the mail. Um, and there is a quite well-developed, but also incredibly complicated and multi-part postal system. There are um, state-run uh, postal ships. There are also people who just will send things, you know, batches of letters with somebody they know is going on a ship. 
People often will write multiple copies of the same letter because there's no assurance that the one that you're sending um, will have gotten there. Um, but uh, it's a mobile society. And one mark of the mobility is that you do have stuff from a lot of places. And you have Europeans, as you saw um, in Fustat by uh, the kind of later- that, that was that was not really my question was more how did the documents of the Geniza get all over oh into i'm so private? sorry okay my apologies okay you should just read sacred trash so it's a really really complicated story that i think is actually still unfolding but basically stuff starts to trickle out um, on the antiquities market when the synagogue is half kind of demolished for reconstruction um, there's a very famous story about Ben Sira, and that story belongs to this process that a page from Ben Sira shows up on the antiquities market. These two Scottish women who are kind of um, uh, uh, accomplished but amateur philologist explorers buy it and bring it back to England and show it to Solomon Schachter, and he's amazed and goes, you know, uh, goes to Egypt. So you have people sort of getting alerted to the fact that uh, this material is there and exists. Um, and uh, there were several major, major collections that were removed um, with the permission of the community by different collectors and made their way to different libraries. So the major one in Cambridge is uh, the Taylor Schechter collection. That's the stuff Schechter took out. There's a big collection in JTS, which um, somebody named Adler took out. Um, and there's lots of smaller collections that were either purchased or taken out by other people. Um, sort of the ethics and process of this is in the process of being rethought now. Um, and this scholar that I mentioned, Rep Rebecca Jefferson, is actually coming out, I would say, in the next few years with a really um, kind of interesting book on this. Um, but it, it was an ad hoc and not, you know, uh, it, it's part of the kind of antiquities rush in the 19th century in Egypt. Um, a, 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 late part of it is part of a bigger story of Europeans coming out and just taking massive quantities of things out of Egypt. So there are uh, a couple more questions, one of them relatively quick and one of them uh, maybe a good one to end on. So I'll, I'll ask the quick one first, which is what kind of ink was used oh. <laughs> um, for the documents? Okay, so um, that's funny because I, I wish that I remembered now. Um, there has been one paper on this just recently written by a woman, um, Zena Cohn, who is starting to analyze this, and I just don't remember the details. Um, but whoever that was, you could email me and I'll send you the paper because this is something that really hasn't been looked at extensively at all. Um, even the paper hasn't been analyzed um, in great depth to try to like diversify or be able to analyze you know, where it's from specifically. Um, although there is a great section on paper making in Marina Resto's new book. All right, uh, and, and the second question, uh, what would you say is the biggest surprising find from a social perspective? There are many, many surprising finds. Um, let me think. So, um, there are many, and I would say, you know, uh, the kind of dumbest but truest answer is that it's the interplay of things we're familiar with with things that just seem completely alien um, that is the constant pleasure of working with this material um, but from my own work um, I'll tell you the, the the most surprising thing that I found in working on my first and so far only book um, is what a different model of family relationships these people had um, from what we have um, and I think you got a taste of that maybe in some of these documents, but um, there was a kind of uh, sense that people stayed much, much more connected to their birth relatives than to relatives uh, that they became related to through marriage, including their spouses. So um, marriage was, you know, we get glimpses of what appear to be happy marriages, but much more often the unhappy ones surface in the documents. But in general, even marriages that seem like they're not in trouble, people are just, women don't wanna to move to be with their husbands if their own birth relatives are somewhere else. They much more wanna stick with their birth relatives and that's the kind of enduring bond. Um, and it's very, very, um, a, a kind of major open question that hasn't really been looked at is how that then affects children's relationship with their own parents when you have this kind of fractured uh, model of kinship. 
Um, okay, I'll, I see the last question. I'll answer this and then I'll let everybody go to sleep. Um, what other Genesis have been found? Um, no other Genesis have been found that are like this one, but recently a much smaller, but still incredibly fascinating collection of documents from Afghanistan has turned up, the so-called Afghan Geniza, um, purchased by the National Library of Israel, which is a group of uh, literary texts and documents in Judeo-Persian from the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, that is currently being worked on for the first time. Okay, perhaps we should stop there. I, I was gonna say, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we could go keep going for quite some time, but in, in fairness to people who uh, may have budgeted their time appropriately, um, I, I wanna thank you on, on behalf of the thank shul, you. on behalf of the uh, large group of attendees tonight and everyone who participated. Um, thank you so much for spending the evening with us and for sharing with us um, and look forward to learning more. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much.